seat. Please come up here and join us. We're going to have an awesome conversation about the boss effect. My name is Amber Coleman Mortley. I lead community and culture at the Female Quotient. I'm so excited to be joined with these really amazing people here today. So I'm going to ask you all who you are, what you do. What's one cool thing that you've witnessed at CES? I'm going to start over here. All right, hi, I'm Katie Kelly. I'm an executive director at JP Morgan Chase. My current role is head of marketing for offers and shopping. Uh, one cool thing I've witnessed, I mean, I think this is pretty cool. I, I, haven't, been to this, I, I haven't been to one of the equality lounges before and I'm just like blown away by the energy here, so I'll have to go with that. Katie, you're hired. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Tamara Bedrosi and I work for Sirius XM. I oversee multicultural, our agency partnerships as well as our retail media networks and I was super excited about the Audio is Magic Sirius XM immersive experience we put on yesterday. Excellent. Hey everyone, I'm Bill Briggs. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Deloitte and I think for me it's seeing what we used to see CES as all consumer technology and of course that's here, but the biotech, the ag tech, the space tech, the retail, the, the, the convergence of industries has been amazing. Awesome, awesome. I'm Janet Creaser. I'm the senior vice president at Ipsos and I lead a group of human factors researchers. And the most exciting thing I saw this morning was drone soccer um, over at the Venetian. So that was pretty cool. Uh, how did, before we keep going, how did they execute that? <laughs> There were flying drones, there was a red team and a blue team, and it looked an awful lot like Quidditch. That's Aww. beautiful. Harry Potter, okay. Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Kathy Yo. I'm thrilled to be here. I am the Chief Marketing Officer of the North America Service Business at Samsung Electronics, that's a mouthful. Uh, so what do I do? I oversee brand and performance marketing across our TV and mobile services like Gaming Hub, Art Store on the Frame, as well as our monetization arm, Samsung Ads. And I'm going to plug Samsung for a little bit because it That's really right. was the coolest thing that I saw. Um, the transparent micro LED, it's really cool. So I see a few nods here and they're not from Samsung, so I'm just going to say thank you. It is a transparent screen with actual crystal clear imagery. And it just kind of brings light, like what kind of visuals can we do on that? Not just for consumers, but also in the commercial space. So I thought it was really cool. Okay, also not going to lie, like that display right in the middle, a nod. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stacy Doriso. I work um, at Initiative, the media agency. I'm responsible for Initiative in the US. I've seen a couple cool things. I'm going to uh, give a shout out to Weezer, who I saw perform last night at an event, right? That's cool. Yes, yes. But as it relates to CES proper, I would say uh, to your point, Bill, about the industry's beauty tech seems to be a big one this year that's pretty cool. And I'll go check out Samsung. <laughs> All right. Okay. So if you haven't been on the show floor, please make sure that you go because a lot of really amazing things that we've heard here. All right. So let's jump right into our questions because we have a lot of people and a little bit of time. Um, in your opinion and experience, what are some of the underlying reasons for workplace dissatisfaction? Tamara, I'm going to come to you first. I'm going to popcorn it because I want to make sure I say everyone's names. So Tamara, I'm coming to you first. Sure. So. I think the biggest reason for workplace dissatisfaction today is that we are w using resources and skills from 2019 and 2020, and we're trying to retrofit them or force fit them on this new world, right? 2020, the pandemic happened and the world changed so much, and I feel like we're not giving the space for the fact that for two years, mothers and fathers were working at home, they were bringing their children to work, they were picking their kids up from school, and now we're back and we're like, get in the office and stay there from nine to five and just we're not giving the space for the fact that the world changed. I think I that's the core of it. Very, very clear. Thank you so much. Janet. Um, I can follow on that, but I also think that moving from 2018 through 2020 as someone who's been working at home for a really long time, we're also trying to, um, we're not having people engage, I think, in the ways that we want them to engage. So just seeing a face on tech over a meeting is not sufficient, right? We still need those opportunities to engage personally, um, organically with each other. And then I think the other thing is transparency gets lost when you're working remotely. So we have to have more effective communication with our teams. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How is your work connected to the objectives of the company? And how does your leaders, how do your leaders communicate that to you 
in a way that helps you feel like you're still a part of the team, even when you're distributed across the country or the world. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy. Yeah, I'd say um, I think it's probably related to both of what you just said, but I kind of think of it as uh, two factors. One, changing expectations of people. A lot has changed for how what people expect to get out of work, what they want to get professionally out of relationships, in office, remote, or whatnot. And then two, the dynamics have changed, right? What a workplace is and what it means has changed significantly. So all of that contributes to um, dissatisfaction. And I think what we have to solve for is the culture that becomes the foundation for solving all of it. Excellent, Bill. Yeah, uh, purpose and empowerment gap. And I think it plays on all three points. The why uh, in why job and why it matters bigger picture than just the day to day and then a path for growth, a path to how can I help shape my destiny, what I want to do. And that takes a lot of time and effort for leaders to invest in their individual team members to make them confident in the path. Thank you. I didn't forget about you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could echo all of those sentiments and I think it really boils down to employees at times feeling like there's a lack of empathy from leaders. Because of all these things, all of these considerations, every employee is unique and individual and what drives them is different. So I think we have to kind of take the space to really have leaders and managers understand their teams and what motivates them. Uh, and then hopefully try to work around that and, and build that culture together. Thank you. All right. So, Bill, I'm going to come to you first with this question. You know, research is showing people leave because, well, womp womp, they don't have a great manager, right? Um, so, you know, what are some of the skills and resources that you believe are absolutely crucial with equipping, you know, managers and leaders so that they can be better? Yeah. Um, we put in place a few years ago upward and peer level feedback and it has been a game changer. Now there's a debate about should that be evaluative or not? Should it be a part of performance management? Um, but the fact that you can have a safe anonymous place to be given, and, and then coaching and mentorship to put that into action. So you don't want to react to every single bit of feedback you get, but there's absolutely usually a through line that'll make you better as a leader and make your people trust you more. Okay, I appreciate that, I appreciate that. Kathy. I want to build on what Bill said. Um, I think transparency builds trust, not just in terms of transparency of your business goals and what your achievements are going to look like, but do you guys ever go into one of those sessions where you have an evaluation meeting and you're shocked at your manager's feedback about what they think you're doing versus what you're really doing? And I find that so surprising because it should never be the case. As a leader, as a manager, there should be feedback constantly. There should never be these surprise moments. I think that um, my team, I'm seeing some of them here, they know me for tough love and really is tough love because I ultimately am looking to empower them. So I think it's transparency builds trust, but you also need to put it into practice. I think a lot of good leaders want to think that they're teaching you how to be a better leader, but then they don't empower you to do so. So you need to give them an opportunity to actually showcase that and exercise it. And there will be mistakes made, but I think that's one of the strongest things about being a leader is to admit where you make mistakes and be able to improve upon that. I appreciate that. Katie, I want to hear your thoughts just a little bit about, you know, how can we support managers, you know, as they are going on this journey because we don't want more people to leave because they're terrible. Yeah, I think number one is setting clear expectations as to what it means to be a manager at your organization. I joined Chase through an acquisition of a startup with 30 people, joined a very large organization. There are very different expectations. So I think it's really important that there's just clarity between you and your leaders on what that means. And advice I would definitely give early managers is if you're not given those guidelines, work on creating them yourself, bring them to your manager. It's a great opportunity to like pull together the things that you've seen others do that you really were inspired by, and it shows leadership in itself that you're creating that. Thank you. Stacy. you know, again, like, we've got a lot of really great feedback on this question, but I still want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think um, from my perspective, I, well, the word you said earlier, Katie, is exactly what it's about, is empathy. And how do you teach or train on empathy, though, is, is really hard. There's a lot of soft skills I think we have to teach and train people on now um, in, our, in our new normal. So we've done a couple of, we've built a couple of programs at Initiative to enable empathy. Um, some with our clients, which we call empathy charters, which said guardrails around how we work together, what we think partnership should look like. 
and we've done some internal things um, where we walk a mile in each other's shoes across accounts or clients maybe, across crafts and expertise areas, but it, give, it builds empathy for what we go through. It builds relationships, it does a lot of things to help people, I think, um, in maybe a more subtle way. I love that word, empathy charters. Did I hear that correctly? Because yes. it's kind of loud in here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, if we're talking about leaving managers, I agree with all of you. Empathy is incredibly important. Um, one of the other things I think is that your leaders have to be able to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, as someone who's worked for managers who really didn't understand my role in the organization, didn't understand what we were doing, it becomes very hard to, to help your employees have influence when you don't understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so I think for if we're putting people in places of leadership where maybe they haven't led those skill sets before, there needs to be some orientation to that. And then the other thing is, I love the walking in the other people's shoes. I'm a user experience researcher, we do that all the time. And <laughs> it, it's extremely important for building that understanding of what, why, when, how, and then the other thing is just as a leader, understanding that all your team members are different, they have different goals, different objectives, and your ongoing feedback with them should be about their goals, their objectives, and helping them meet those, and never assuming that they want the same objectives that you have, for example. So how are they connected to the team? How are the different skill sets that everyone has plays together versus everyone has to be the same? You know, we don't want a bunch of round pegs and round holes. We want all different shapes and sizes of holes and diversity across our teams, and we want to leverage those skills. And teaching managers how to do that, I think, is critical. Very critical. Thank you. Tamara. Okay. I'm going to try and wrap up everything everyone said. With I won't forget it. Um, so the first thing you have to be is adaptive. It's really important now. Our world is changing at a super fast pace. I mean, raise your hand if you're in a new role this year that you haven't been in before. Right? You'll probably be in a new role next year, so get used to it. It's changing. You have to move, move with it. Um, everyone said empathetic. I'm almost going to add to that to be emotionally intelligent. I think it's incredibly important for managers to be emotionally intelligent these days. Um, the third thing, Bill, you hit on this earlier, is this idea of purpose-driven leadership, right? Four years ago, I could tell my team, like, go out, hit your number, we're going to make money, and that's all they cared about. There didn't need to be anything more, and now it's like, how does my goal align with the broader company's mission? And what are you doing for social responsibility? And you can't just tell your team to hit their numbers anymore. Like so much more matters. And if you can't convey to your team the, the broader good and the broader vision, they're not gonna wanna be there. Um, finally, I mean, not finally, there's two more. Uh, I think we all have done these company surveys and what we hear time and time again is we lack culture, right? We lack culture, but we don't wanna come to the office. So now we have to figure out how to be a remote leader. And that is incredibly difficult. I can't say I do it well. I think it's incredibly difficult to build and connect people when you're all working remote. So it's not easy to be a manager these days. Um, and lastly, it's like this plethora of technology we have at our fingertips and everything is robots and AI. And like, what does that mean as a manager? And how do we bring back the human connection? I think about that all the time. So I think I hit on everything. I tried to wrap it all up for you. Listen, no, Tamara, <laughs> you have actually pulled on some really super amazing threads. I actually want to take us down a winding road a little bit sure. to this point of like company culture and how we build it in a remote world because that is a part of making sure that our employees stay. Bill, you're raising your mic, so yeah, I'll let no, you go. I, I, just just our, our CEO makes a point about culture. There tends to be a lot of nostalgia uh, and retrospection of what it used to be. Yes. And it's such a living, active, it, it, it's what we're creating today for tomorrow. And it has to take all of these factors into play because we're not going back. Technology advancement isn't going to stop or slow down. And so it's, it, it doesn't mean don't listen to the voices saying, ah, the good old days. But uh, we tend to romanticize it a bit. And it, it doesn't matter as much as looking forward. I really, really appreciate you saying that very clearly. Um, Stacy, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this whole tension between remote technology world with building culture. Yeah, and I think the reality is we're neither one or the other anymore, right? We're essentially hybrid. And what that means, inherent in that, is flexibility. So if we don't think about it as just returning to an office or returning to the past, I love how you said that, Bill, um, 
It's about, though, creating opportunities for connections, for shared experiences, for togetherness, because at the end of the day, no matter what technology takes on, all of those things still matter to us as people. They matter to our growth, and there are some real soft skills in there that aren't that can't be taught or done by technology. And I think even just all of us being here this week, there's a lot of that. It's about relationships, connections, uh, people we know, relationships we're starting today and we'll build for the future. So I do think it's important to think about in a hybrid and flexible world, when and how for the right reasons do people come back together. I love that. Intentionality in our coming together. Katie, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, you just said it, intention, I think, uh, Companies are doing a lot of exciting things to bring people together. They're doing, you know, virtual events. They're doing learning series that people can join. But I think that the ones that are the most impactful are that have like a very clear purpose, and so that you're bringing people together around that purpose, and you're not just like putting them all into a Zoom room and hoping that connections happen. Um, so I, yeah, that, that's where I done that one. Yes, plus one, plus one. Okay, Janet and Kathy, I'm gonna ask the same question, but I want you to like kind of lean into what is the manager's role and really making sure that the culture happens while we're in this hybrid world. So Kathy, I'm gonna come to you first. You know, I have to say I'm still finding the right balance because mm. we're not only, as you noted, in the hybrid space, but I'm also on the plane a lot. Um, as a manager, it is really important for me that I try to make the time to see folks in person. I know that that speaks more to the in-person aspect of it, but in that moment, when you're reunited in person, in a room, and being able to brainstorm or to whiteboard ideas, or just even to be able to grab a meal, I think it brings back a little bit of that human aspect to who you work with. And I'll also share, you know, we have a lot of great programs at Samsung, but one that I'm particularly proud of uh, is an ERG that I helped start found is called Women Plus. And Women Plus is for men and women, but it is an organization that is really advocating for women in the workplace, but it's become actually a community for all. So in this world of hybrid and working and return to office, we find that there's communities that are not related to your professional background or your role. They're actually just coming together based on affinity, interests. Um, I will tell you that I love doing one-on-one -on -one calls on phone. We will literally go for a walk virtually in whatever city you're in <laughs> and do one-on-one -on -one calls. I will grab a coffee virtually off of the phone and just do a phone call because I think it allows you to take away from sitting in that seat, being in front of a screen, which has become very stale at the moment. So. Um, anything that can get you a little bit more connected to the human side, I think is going to allow for better success. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to actually take on something Bill said about culture is evolving. Um, I used to work for a company where one of the goals was to hire people fresh out of school and raise them up the company X way, right? But our, cu our culture should always be evolving. I think it's the manager or the leader's job to hire someone in to look at what that new person is bringing to that team, again, I'm gonna use the word diversity, skills, education, background. What are they bringing? How does that augment your team? And then being the person who champions that, being the person who also, while you're onboarding them, explains how other people are bringing their unique skills to the team and how that all works together to create the dynamic that you want and the culture that you want to succeed on your team. Love that. Okay, so as we're in this, looking ahead, thinking of the reality of right now, we want to think about the future too. You know, I'd love to know, and Katie, I'm going to go with you first, and I will popcorn around. Um, what innovative approaches do you see emerging in leadership training um, that could really change the way in which we embody leadership? I think we're going to continue to see personalization come into play because it really isn't a one-size-fits-all for training. Your role, it's dependent on your role, the dynamic of your team, the structure of your team, all of those things. So I'm excited to see, like, I think I haven't been to a panel where they haven't talked about AI, but how is AI, like, how are we going to use the data from our different surveys to make more informed decisions on the training that people need. Um, so I, I think it's going to just get more tailored and you're going to see better results because it's going to be more focused on the individual. I love that personalization. Janet. Um, one of the things I've seen work really well um, and I think is implemented in a lot of companies and should continue is implicit bias training. So how do yeah. we identify our own biases? How do we keep each other accountable for those? And how are we ensuring that we're not using those against us? So we're all very much attracted to like, you know, we like what reminds, of a, reminds us of ourselves when we were young, for example, if you're an older leader. Um, and we have to check against that because that may not be the right fit that you need or you might be championing people 
unfairly. And so just being aware of that, um, I think that's the one thing that I would really like to see continue and get better. Here, here, Stacy. I love that. And that was going to be one of my answers as well. So I'll, I won't say it again. Okay. But I do think, you know, I think there's skills um, and emerging technology training that are going to be incumbent on all of us. That's just a, kind of a given as we all evolve, as we set people up for success. I think what's not a given, though, and I'm thinking a lot about things like, um, how do we build relationships in our new normal, new normal? How do people network in a new normal? Things like that that are more about people and connections, that stuff's harder to teach, and I don't know anyone that's kind of nailed it yet, but we're thinking a lot about that. Okay, that sounds like a business idea to somebody out there. Oh, all, all right, right. <laughs> let's do that, <laughs> Stacy. <laughs> Bill. Yeah, actually, so we have a, one of our teams is Unlimited Reality, which is the metaverse, industrial metaverse, and a huge piece of it is augmented work experience. And people think about it in training of hard skills, but there's a really interesting soft skill. Like that immersive, it becomes an empathy engine, and it helps you practice giving feedback, or what does it feel like to be an underrepresented person in a meeting that isn't getting heard and paid attention to? And so we're, we're seeing an uptick in, can we apply technology for a very human need of how to be a better leader? I love that. Tomorrow. Uh, I think the technology and data that we have at our fingertips now is incredible. But I would argue that what we are lacking and what we are missing, and when people say we don't have culture, I think what we don't have is a connection, right? We spent two years talking to each other over Zoom. Half the time you're talking to black screens because people don't want to put their cameras on. And it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to build a connection over a Zoom screen. So now we're back in this world and we're struggling with it. And I'm struggling with it as a leader sometimes. It's like, that's what I think is missing. And we lean so heavy into training and technology and data. And all I want to do is like build a connection. I mean, for, for six months, we couldn't stand within six feet of one another, right? You couldn't cry on my shoulder. You can't give me a hug. And now we're back and we can hug and we can cry and we can do all that. But it's, it's weird. It's not quite what it used to be. And I, I want to start something new and I want to build it. But I want to be old school, right? I want to go back to just like building that human connection because honestly, that's what I think is missing. Enjoy my business. Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, literally like, going to connect those dots, but you did it. <laughs> we'll all join. <laughs> Yo, Kathy, I'd love to hear, hear what you have to say. Well, all of my fellow panelists here have spoken to many of the points that I want to raise. I'm going to speak a little bit differently on um, the importance of mental health, because yes. I think that we talk a lot about culture in the workplace and community building, but your individual mental health is such an important point today in your professional and personal life. Um, I will tell you that 2023 was not a good year for me. Um, it doesn't seem like it was a good year for many folks. And you struggle with not only how do you balance this work-life experience, you talk about a work-life balance, but it really is a cycle. It's not a balance in itself. So I think going beyond the human connection and being able to make sure that you're checking in and having the tools, the resources. Um, I think many of the companies here probably have proper therapy or mental health support, but I think it goes beyond that. I think the leadership level, you do have to connect and check how is their stress level, how is their management level, their anxiety level. I think there are so many aspects to mental health um, that has become prevalent in both the work and life place. Oh, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy, for that, because 2023, oof. All right, so we have about two minutes left, and we want to give each person a quick soundbite word of wisdom. So we're talking about how we can be great managers. We're bringing in this element of employee well-being. I'd love to hear from each of you. And Katie, I'm going to start with you first, and we'll just go down the line and end with Stacey, who has a new business now. Okay, all right. <laughs> My main piece of advice is don't try to do everything as a manager, like leverage your team. It, like, the whole t it takes a village, like I do think it does and, and, and you really shouldn't have to hold all that on your shoulders to the point of mental health. Like you need to be in a good position and you need to have partners who are gonna help you. So uh, it's, it's not just you, it's a team. What? I mean, I love the idea of just like putting yourself in their shoes, right? You can't just talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. Stacey, you said that earlier. And you can't build a connection with someone until you truly understand what they're going through. So that's what I think about every single day before I enter into every conversation that I have is what's on their plate, what did they go through this morning, and, and how can I really live their life to understand how to build that connection? Yeah, uh, Kathy, I, I, your final point I think was brilliant. And work-life balance, when we talk about balance, people think it's a destination. And anyone that does yoga knows that balance is a very active, tense pursuit. 
and it's ongoing. So for yourself as a leader and for your teams, how do you make that an environment people can appreciate? Um, for me, it's what motivates my team members. So what do they want? Where do they want to go? And you know, ultimately, that even results in if they want to leave. You know, how do we help them be successful no matter what? Um, and that's really what I would go with. Help your team be successful. Love that. Um, I will say it's to listen. It's the probably, I, I paused and hesitated there because there's a, quite a few things I would want to say, but um, it's probably an area that I'm working on still is to listen. It's very easy as a manager and leader to direct, to give guidance, to say, um, but there's a lot of power and strength in listening. And if you listen carefully, you're going to hear what motivates each member because every member is different. You're also going to hear what makes them tick, what gets them excited, and then you're going to become a better manager that's really s suitable to every person that's on your team and finding a way to empower them to be a better version of themselves. I am going to end where I started, which is the game has changed. Um, and what's exciting in that is we're the leaders that have to change what the bar is. And so I think let's stop holding ourselves accountable to what used to make sense for leadership and our people, and let's create the new normal. Yes, to that yeah. exclamation point. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Listen, Mike, okay? Um, I just want to thank my panelists, experts. Please follow them and their organizations on LinkedIn. We really, really appreciate everything that each of you shared. Thank you all who are in the audience listening. Thank you to the people who are watching. Um, we just want to say... We really, really appreciate our community here at the FQ. Everyone have a great rest of your CES. Thank you. Thank you.